Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this episode, we're going to talk about ShimCache, also known as App Compat Cache. Specifically, we're going to clear up some common misconceptions and take a look at how this artifact behaves in Windows 10. Notice I said Windows 10 because there are some key differences when comparing this behavior to Windows 7, 8, and 8.1, but more on that later. Let's start with the facts, or as I like to call them, the Arta facts. Get it? Okay, humor me. I'm going to keep using that now in future episodes because why not? Okay, let's take a look at what we have here. And first, a quick note on the colors. The items in green are the very common knowledge, easy to understand things with regards to Shimcash. The items in yellow are often sources of confusion, so pay close attention to those. And the items in red are, I would say, the most often misunderstood things with regards to Shimcash. So starting at the top, in a nutshell, Shimcache will provide backwards compatibility. So in other words, it allows us to run older software in newer versions of the Windows operating system. And if anything needs to be adjusted, it can be shimmed, as in adding extra properties to that particular executable to allow it to run in that newer version of Windows. That's really it in a nutshell. And that's the extent of what you really need to know in terms of forensic application of Shimcache. All right, so what is stored within the shim cache? The executable file name, the file path, and a timestamp. Now let's talk about that timestamp. The timestamp is the last modification time of the file. It is not the time the item was added to the shim cache. It is absolutely not the time the program was executed. It is literally the last modification time of that file the M timestamp in Mac B, which again stands for modification, access, MFT record change, and birth. So that's definitely a source of confusion. Make sure you don't forget that. Windows 7, 8, and 8.1 had this thing that we referred to as an execution flag. It was absolutely not called that, nor was that its intention. It was an insert flag of some kind, but the point being is that we could use this to determine whether or not a program actually ran. But again, that was in Windows 7, 8, and 8.1. In Windows 10, there is no such flag and you cannot use Shimcache to prove execution in Windows 10. I repeat, you cannot use Shimcache to definitively say whether or not something did or did not execute in Windows 10. More on that in a bit in terms of what Shimcache can provide us, so just hang tight. Now here's a weird thing. The files visible in the Windows Explorer can determine what is added to the Shimcache. So imagine you have 1.exe through 10.exe, and you put those files on the system, and then navigate to a folder, and inside that folder, the Windows Explorer window is sized such that you are seeing 1 through 5.exe. That means only 1 through 5.exe would actually be added to the shim cache. Now, if you took your mouse and resized the window and then 6.exe was visible, guess what? 6.exe gets added to the shim cache. It really does work like that. I know it's weird, but I'm going to show it to you in the demo. So again, stand by. Renaming or moving a file will cause it to be reshimmed. That's an important thing to know. And of course, if you do this, if you rename a file or move a file, does the modification time, the M time of that file change? No, right? I can take test.exe and I can rename it to test2.exe. I haven't changed the contents of the file. I just literally changed the metadata. I renamed it. It's not going to update the M timestamp. So often we can look through the shim cache and find things with the exact same M timestamp and derive from that, in some cases, that that was the same file, just under two different names. In fact, the shim cache actually stores the full 64-bit timestamp. And if you look at it at that resolution and you have two 64-bit timestamps that match exactly, I will pretty much guarantee that that is the same file. So if you saw test.exe and test2.exe and that M timestamp at the 64-bit granularity level was the same, yeah, that's the same file. The last 1,024 entries are retained in the cache. That's an important concept to understand. 
Also interesting is that most tools will output the data with the most recently shimmed entries at the top. So again, the most recently added things to the shim cache will be at the top of the output. And you'll see this when we use Eric Zimmerman's app compact cache parser to parse the shim cache. The shim cache itself is stored within the Windows system registry hive. And here's the other super important thing to realize. The shim cache is only flushed to disk, only written to disk on reboot or shutdown. Again, only written on reboot or shutdown. Now, there is the ability, there exists the capability, I should say, to use a plugin called shim cache mem alongside volatility to actually extract shim cache out of memory in some cases. But as we often say with memory, there is no guarantee in memory forensics. What you're looking for may or may not be within that memory capture that you have, but in some cases it may be possible to actually pull shim cache out of a system's memory. All right, so those are all of our shim cache artifacts. Now let's talk about why we should even care about shim cache to begin with, especially if we can't use it to prove execution in Windows 10. Well, here's why you should care. Shim cache can be used to show files present on or accessed via a given system. Even if we can't determine whether or not something executed on a Windows 10 system, we can show that an executable file once existed on that system. You see, deleting or even securely deleting an executable does not cause it to be removed from the shim cache. This is a key concept to understand. So if an attacker drops evil.exe on a victim system and then later decides to cover his or her tracks by deleting that file, there's a chance that an entry will still exist within the cache. Another key thing to realize is that executables do not have to reside on the C drive or on any other internal drive to be added to the cache. So if you connect a USB hard drive or USB flash drive, or even browse to a network location via a UNC path, executables within those locations will be added to the cache, provided they are visible within the Explorer window, which again, we're going to see that within the demo coming up. And lastly, anti-forensics is made more complicated by the fact that the data resides in memory, as we mentioned, until reboot or shutdown, at which time the shim cache is committed to the registry. So if an attacker did want to clear the cache, he or she would be unable to do so until after the data had been flushed to the disk. All right, so enough of the dry stuff. Let's jump into the demo and see all of this in action. And I think all of the pieces will come together and it will make a lot more sense. Let's switch over to a Windows 10 machine. And on the desktop of this computer, you'll notice that I have a file called shimcache.7z. This zip file contains 137 executables named 1.exe through 137.exe. We're going to be using this for the demo. I'll go ahead and right click on this and go to 7-zip and extract it into a folder called shimcache. But I'm not going to open that folder by double clicking on it and viewing the contents within Windows Explorer. Instead, I'm going to go ahead and go down to the command prompt and do a directory listing to show you those files. But again, I am not going to view them within Windows Explorer. So the question then becomes, will these files end up in the shim cache once we reboot? So here they are, all 137 of them. And what we're going to do is find out by rebooting this machine, the first of many times, so that the shim cache will be flushed to disk. And spoiler alert, they're not going to end up in the cache. Let's go ahead and reboot and I'll show you. And we're back where we started after reboot number one. You'll notice that I have an administrative Windows terminal opened and minimized at the bottom of the screen. We're going to need that in just a second because we're at this point ready to parse the shim cache for the first time. To do that, we're going to use an Eric Zimmerman tool called App Compact Cache Parser. So let's go ahead and click on Windows terminal and we'll change into the tools Zimmerman directory, which is where I've placed the Zimmerman tools. And I'll first run App Compact Cache Parser without any options to show you the available options. I'd like to draw your attention to the F, which normally would be used to specify the full path to the system hive that you would want to process for a dead system. But in this case, if you leave it off, it will use the live registry of this machine, which is exactly what we want to do. So really, all we need to do is give it the dash dash CSV to tell it where to place the results 
And optionally, I can specify CSVF, which is going to be the file name into which I want the results written. I'll just call it reboot1.csv, and that's it. You'll notice it found 882 of the maximum 1,024 cache entries, and it saved the results to reboot1.csv. I have associated CSV files with Timeline Explorer on this machine, so double-clicking on it will open this CSV in that utility. And I would like to point out that cache entry position zero at the very top of the list is going to be the most recently added thing into the shim cache. So in other words, the most recently shimmed entries are going to be at the top of the list. Here I've highlighted the first 10, and I don't see one through 137.exe present within any of these entries. Do you? Not a single one of them are there, right? So as I mentioned, just extracting the files onto disk and even viewing them within the command prompt was not enough to have them added to the shim cache. But now I've opened it within Windows Explorer. And if you take a look at what's on screen, you'll see that this is that folder with the full 137 items, but only visible are one through 23.exe. But if you take a look just barely, you can see the very start of the next file down, which is 24.exe. It's not really visible on screen, but the very top sliver of the icon for that file name is visible just a bit under 23.exe. So let's say one through 24 are visible. Keep that in mind because guess what? We're going to reboot for the second time. And I think you'll see where I'm going with this because I think you know what we're going to find out when we parse the shim cache again. So let's take a look. And we're back again after the second reboot as last time I already have an administrative windows terminal opened and minimized at the bottom. So let's go ahead and open that back up and head over to our tools Zimmerman directory so we can rerun app compact cache parser just as we did last time. So we'll change into tools Zimmerman. And again, the only options I'm using are dash dash CSV to specify the directory into which I want the results to be placed and the optional dash dash CSVF to give it a file name, in this case, reboot2.csv. We should see additional cache entries this time. And if we take a look at the results, we do see that there are now 907 cache entries and the results were saved to that reboot2.csv file. So let's go ahead and open that up. And what I'll do is I'll highlight the relevant entries to make it easier for you to see. So let's go ahead and maximize this and do exactly that. Remember the most recent entries are at the top starting at cache entry position zero. And if we go ahead and highlight all the way down to here and then over to here, check it out. What is the highest numbered executable you see here? I see 24.exe at cache entry position number 19. How about that? That matches what we saw in the Windows Explorer window right there. So pretty interesting. So now let's fiddle with it even more. Let's go back to our shim cache folder on the desktop and interact with the folder this time by just resizing the window, not actually scrolling it, but just resizing it. So again, this is just where we left it last time. So what I'll do is I'll go to the right corner of this window and check this out. I'm going to just drag it over a little bit. And now I see 28.exe as the last executable present. But remember last time we actually saw the one plus the last one we saw. So in other words, we saw one greater than the highest number because a sliver of the next file name was visible. In this case, the sliver of 29 is not visible. So I wonder, will we actually see 28.exe or will we also see 29.exe? I guess we'll have to find out. Let's reboot and check it out. It's like deja vu all over again, right? This is reboot number three. And just as before, I've already opened an administrative Windows terminal. We're going to go back into it, change into the tool Zimmerman directory and rerun app compact cache parser yet again, changing only the output file name. In this case, it'll just be reboot 3csv Every time we run this, we should expect the number of cache entries to increase, right? Because we're adding stuff to the shim cache. And in this case, we see there are 913. The results were successfully saved to reboot three. 
So let's minimize this, double click on this so it opens in Timeline Explorer. I'm going to go ahead and highlight all of the entries that come from the Shimcache folder location on the desktop just to make it easier to see. But the real question we had was, are we going to see 28.exe or will we also see 29.exe? And as you can see by looking at the top of the output, we do in fact see 29.exe. Now, why is that? Because it was clearly not visible. Well, my theory is that the status bar at the bottom of the Explorer window was obscuring it, but maybe for the purposes of it being added to the shim cache, it technically was visible, but just being obscured by that status bar, I'm not really sure. But the point is we did see one greater than the last file visible. In this case, 29.exe was present in the cache. All right, let's continue to experiment. Back to the folder again. This time I'm going to maximize it and randomly scroll down a bit. In fact, I'm going to scroll down and stop halfway in between a file name. So let's stop right here. And as you will see, we clearly see 64.exe and then right below it, we see part of 65.exe. Now the question becomes, are we going to see 65.exe? Will we also see 66.exe? Not entirely sure. So you know what happens next. Let's reboot, run it again and see what happens. Okay, we're nearing the end of our demo. Let's go ahead and speed this up a bit and rerun App Compact Cache Parser again for reboot 4.csv. As with previous runs, we should expect an increase in the number of cache entries. In this case, there are 950 and the results were successfully saved to reboot 4.csv. Let's minimize this and open reboot 4. The question we were trying to answer was, are we going to see 63, 64, 65? What are we going to see as the highest numbered file name? And right at the very top of the list, the answer is 65.exe, which makes complete sense because 64 was fully visible and part of 65.exe was visible within the Windows Explorer window. So as I continue to scroll down here, I'll just highlight everything to show you all of these entries being added to the cache. And remember, I could go through and delete 13.exe, but it's not going to remove the entry from the shim cache, even if I securely delete or normally delete whatever the 13.exe file, it's not going to disappear from the cache. So keep that in mind. All right, so there is but one thing left to try. We'll go ahead and reopen this folder. And this time, let's just scroll all the way to the very bottom so we can see 137.exe. This should come as no surprise, but once we reboot, we should see all 137 executables present within the shim cache. And remember, I have not executed any of these, right? You haven't seen me run any of these one through 137 executables. And we have learned from this that simply viewing them within Windows Explorer is enough to have them added to the cache. Also remember that had I viewed this from an external drive or a UNC path, the same principle would apply. All right, final reboot, here we go. And now the exciting conclusion. All right, so we're running App Compact Cache Parser for the last time. This is for reboot number five. So let's see how many cache entries we have this time. And the answer is 1,023. So now we have reboot 5.csv. Let's go ahead and open it. It should come as no surprise that one through 137.exe should now be present. And if we look at cache entry position zero at the very top of the list, sure enough, there is 137.exe. And just for completeness, I'll go ahead and scroll all the way down here and highlight all of them for you. All right. so. Whoops, went too far. Let me go up a bit. There we go. There are all of our entries. All right, cool. So hopefully you have learned from this that Shimcache doesn't work in a way that is intuitive, at least not to me. There's a lot of gotchas. Also, don't forget, see that timestamp right there? Remember, that is the last modified time, as we mentioned in the first part of this episode. That is not the time it was added to the shim cache. It is not the time it was executed because obviously it wasn't executed. It is literally the M time, the modification time. And I'll prove that to you by going down to 137.exe, right click, go to properties, check out the M time here, which I will highlight. You can see it in local time. And if we go back here, 
it matches. So there's both so you can see them. 949 and 2149. There they are. So again, the timestamp in Shimcash is the last modification time, the M in Mac B. And you can see it right there. All right, so I'll spare you the normal recap that we have with most episodes because this episode is already quite long and I've kind of recapped things as we've been going, just reinforcing the points here. Just remember, Shimcash is an odd artifact. It does not work the way most people think it works. And I really hope this episode has driven that point home. And I hope that this is something you can reference. Also remember, this is all subject to change. It's entirely possible that a future Windows 10 update will come out and completely change all of this. But as of right now, when this episode is being published, this is the most current information that we have with regards to the way Shimcash works. All right, so that concludes this 13 cubed episode. As always, I would like to thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing and I'll catch you in the next episode. Oh, and by the way, don't forget, there is a Patreon for 13 cubed. If you would like early access to these episodes and other perks, check it out, patreon.com slash 13 cubed. Thanks as always. See ya.